my lovely imps, we're gonna have a quick talk, okay? We're gonna have a quick talk about kink, about fetish, about paraphilia, about uh, all kinds of stuff. Just a quick one, okay? Um, because uh, people have been talking about a bunch of different stuff. There's been a lot of discourse going on, and I have no interest in uh, like stepping into the drama side of the discourse. I would rather just talk about the subject, okay? Um, so first off, um, uh, kink is a sort of catch-all term that generally refers to um, non-standard uh, 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 non standard uh, practices that are usually in some way tied uh, uh, to sexuality, okay? Um, not all kink is explicitly sexual. So let me give you an example of this. Um, some people are extremely, extremely turned on um, by forming contractual binding relationships with another person um, that include a uh, a you know sort of aspect of control and sometimes they will even wear uh, um, they will even wear uh, you know pieces of clothing that reference this bond that directly and that is can be called rather kinky and yet, Guess what, everybody? It's a wedding ring. Oh, gotcha, zing! You thought I was going for something else. <laughs> no, everybody. Um, it's a wedding ring. Uh, I'm talking about marriage. Okay. Listen. Um, and yes, I I do actually think that there is an aspect of kink for some people that it goes into marriage um, that isn't strictly sexual, but that is nonetheless referential to sexuality, and that's a lot of kink. Okay, there's many different types of kink, um, but kink is a term that sort of broadly refers to um, the communities and actions. Uh, centered around these non-standard uh, uh, interpretations and experiences around sex. And there's all kinds, okay? Um, and not all kink is directly sexual, um, but a lot of it ties to uh, non-standard expression as it ties to sexuality. Um, a fetish is a term uh, uh, that refers to um, basically having a non-standard uh, sexual, um, usually a, a like sexual fixation of some sort or another. And uh, this term is used very um, loosely and colloquially. Um, some people consider um, all kinds of things a fetish like for example uh, one of the most egregious examples of people sort of like diluting the meaning of the word fetish is foot fetishism okay um, when somebody likes boobs we don't call it uh, breast fetishism um, like as it turns out feet are a part of the body and people find lots of parts of the body very attractive. People find backs, necks, lips, noses, ears, uh, teeth, uh, feet, hands, all parts of the body people can find sexual interest and, and, and fascination with. Um, usually when people, well, I should say, usually when people say foot fetish, they actually are just referring to anyone ever finding feet like interesting or sexually provocative, which I think is a very strange thing. And also it produces, a, I know this is a little bit of a distraction, but I think it's important. It also produces this thing where people say the most popular fetish in the world is foot fetish. When it's in reality, it's just that like some people like feet and find them interesting, and they don't necessarily have a fetish. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, what was I going to say? Um, uh, yeah, so, but generally, uh, in good faith, when people aren't just kind of throwing the term around, the term fetish refers to a specific fixation. Um, some people will go so far as to say that like a fetish is like, um, is like when it's your primary interest. And uh, there are a lot of examples um, of, uh, of, of, of this type of thing, though I don't think that, um, 
I don't think that most people anymore really mean the primary example version. What they're talking about with a fetish is an interest in something that's kind of out there. So um, things that people consider uh, a fetish um, is uh, things like vor, inflation, um, choking, uh, spanking, these types of things where that becomes a fixation or something that is a major part of someone's sexuality. Where, um, where yes, Killjoy, excellent example. It's the difference between a feeder and a gourmand. A gourmand uh, might be somebody, or maybe a feedee and a gourmand is a better example. A feedee being somebody who wants to be fed a lot of food because they get sexually turned on by the act of eating lots and lots of food and that might become a big thing that's a big deal for them a huge turn on for them whereas a gourmand might be somebody who just really finds food good and there's no sexual aspect strictly but they just are they they find food as like an art in, incredible and interesting um is that related to weight gaining kinks? Uh, yeah, it usually is. Feedy is is very often tied to weight gain type kinks, um, but it's not the only um, it's not the only way. Some people are really fixated on the weight gain aspect. Some people are really fixated on the food eating aspect. Now, um, then there's a third term which is called a paraphilia. Okay, and a paraphilia is a this is a term that has a dubious uh, acceptance as uh, as far as validity goes, but generally the term refers to um, like a sexual obsession that uh, that it, like interrupts your ability, like a person's ability to engage with sex in a healthy or quote unquote normal way. Now you'll you'll see immediately where some of the issues with the definition or the understanding of paraphilias comes from. Um, some people would consider uh, the sort of famous example of a paraphilia um, was oh my god I can't remember oh now I'm not now I can't remember who wrote about it an early psych psychologist um, uh, it had a patient who was not able to have sex with his wife anymore. And the reason why was not because he found his wife unattractive, but that he could only get aroused by women's shoes. That's it, J the shoe, not a foot, not anything, by women's shoes. The, the women's shoes were what sexually aroused him. And um, allegedly, uh, he was able to slowly sort of get, like, uh, overcome this fixation because he wanted to overcome the fixation because he wanted to enjoy sex with his wife by uh, hanging a woman's shoe over his bed so that while he was having sex with his wife, he could look at the shoe and slowly sort of, like, reassociate his body with having sex with his wife by weaning himself off of looking at the shoe. Um... And uh, and so that's like the sort of classic example of a paraphilia. Now, of course, there are more extreme versions of paraphilias, uh, uh, violent paraphilias and things like that. The problem with this is, of course, that it becomes very difficult to, to draw the line between a paraphilia and, uh, and, a, and a fetish. Now, there's another thing, there's another layer that complicates this entire conversation. So I hope you're following these three definitions so far. We talked about kink being a sort of broad catch-all term for non-standard sexual expressions of sexuality. We talked about fetishes being a uh, non-standard sexual fixation. And we talked about paraphilias being a an attempt to sort of categorize uh, negative fetishes. Fetishes that are negative in a way that they begin to interrupt the life of somebody um, who possesses them. Um, on top of all of this, people conflate all of these terms constantly. So people say kink when they mean fetish. People say fetish when they mean kink. People say paraphilia when they mean kink. People say paraphilia when they mean fetish. And it is a giant, um, you know, mess. Um, it's kind of a big confusing mess. And sometimes this leads to people coming to very, very foolish conclusions um, because they don't take the time to, to sort these things out and try to figure out what someone is actually talking about. An example is the way that kink has increasing, the word kink and conversations around kink have sort of um, 
has, has sort of spread outwards as as the internet has grown because more and more people become familiar with it. And as it turns out, there are a lot of people who have fetishes and who want to engage in kink. Um, and uh, so as a result, uh, there is this tendency to directly conflate the two and sometimes that leads to confusion. Now usually with some good faith engagement and some well asked questions, if somebody is obviously open to discussing this type of thing, you can usually figure out what's meant. But a lot of people never take that time because they jump the gun. And um, yeah, they jump the gun. Now. Where things get really messy, okay? Where things get really, really messy is when the when people overly fixate on this paraphilia aspect, okay? And as a result, attempt to basically psychoanalyze uh, uh, kink and fetishes from a lens of, of trying to identify what's wrong, what's going wrong here. Um, and I think that's a huge, huge mistake. Um, it's, it's a very big mistake. Uh, and I understand where it comes from to a certain degree because, you know, there's this sort of idea that the, the, there's this idea that like, um, well, you don't want people to suffer, right? And you can imagine paraphilias that would be very, very harmful and dangerous. Like, for example, imagine, uh, uh, you know, imagine somebody who had a sort of uncontrolled obsession with violating consent. You can imagine where that could become uh, extremely problematic and harmful, right? Um, but people have to be uh, cautious. Uh, in making assumptions. And one of the things that you will see happen all the time in kink and fetish conversations uh, is assumptions. Just off the, off the cuff, wild assumptions. And usually those are informed by a sort of puritanical form of disgust. Um, someone encounters something that they find icky or that makes them feel uncomfortable. And because they feel discomfort, they assume that there must be something bad going on there. Uh, it is this idea to sort of like hunt down and distance yourself from sin. But of course the reality is that the vast majority of, uh, of fetishes are completely harmless and kink itself like has evolved from a desire to engage in non-standard sexual uh, expression, uh, you know, expression of sexuality um, in the safest way possible. Uh, kink communities came together, uh, and there's a various, there's a couple of different like approaches to to uh, or philosophies around kink. But these communities started to form out of the goal of being able to be safer while exploring all of the things that the human mind and body are capable of. So, um, an example. I want to give an example of this. Um, I, I gave a joke example before about Vor, um, but uh, I'm going to give an example of this. Wax, okay? Hot wax, all right? A lot of people, okay, are there's just a there's a lot of people who are really really into uh, masochism. Basically, they experience a form of sexual pleasure from experiencing pain, and that doesn't mean that like they will enjoy getting in a car crash, okay? Um, but it means that there are certain types of pain and types of pain that 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 give pleasure or arousal, okay? Um, and um, one common uh, sort of aspect of that, one common fetish or, um, uh, or it, when it's you know, sort of engaged in kink is uh, hot wax, okay? Now, as it turns out, um, there are a ton of ways to play with hot wax that can be very enjoyable for the people involved without doing long-term, permanent, lasting damage to the body. Um, but there are also ways to engage in uh, in playing with hot wax that can actually hurt you pretty bad and put you in danger. So kinksters uh, um, are 
would uh, have historically sort of come together to gather information, to share information and best practices in a controlled environment in order to be able to safely engage in something that is pleasurable and harmless when done correctly. Um, you see what I mean? And of course, there's the further aspect that's been very important in kink communities, which is discussing consent. Because um, a lot, one of the most common uh, uh, types of, of, of sort of fetish, of, of, of sexual fixation, is what is called power exchange. Um, power exchange being dominance and submission, where someone is in charge and perhaps has some level of ownership or control over another person. As it turns out, this is so common that I even at the beginning of the segment made the joke about the wedding rings. Uh, if you go and learn about, of course, the history of marriage, marriage is very explicitly a power exchange. Uh, a biblical marriage, from the very roots of biblical marriage, um, at least Christian marriage. Uh, obviously, there have been other forms of marriage in the past, but Christian marriage specifically uh, explicitly states that the male is the dominant role and the female is the submissive role and that there is a power exchange that intrinsically happens that is often signified by different types of rings. You know, often the male in a relationship will wear a gold, sol a solid gold band uh, that is, you know, thick and simply adorned and a, a sort of display of power where the wife will wear a thin, fragile diamond ring um, that, you know, is dainty and beautiful. Um, yeah, so the, the sort of power exchange uh, fixation, sexual fixation, um, the, the fetish um, is, is incredibly common. And so, of course, uh, kink as a concept sort of arose as a way to uh, include these, these fetishes, these specific fixations, while also recognizing that, hey, these have to be talked about sometimes in a non-sexual context for, for safety, for wellness, for, for mutual growth and enjoyment. And as it turns out, when you do it as such, you can minimize risks while maximizing benefits, which is just something you have to do in life all the time. Killjoy40k says, if you remove context, uh, if you remove a lot of the context, a collar and a ring mean exactly the same thing, especially the closer you get to trad. Yes, that's very, very true. Um, there, I think there are some differences. Um, but yes, there are a lot of similarities between collars and wedding rings. Um, the wedding ring, of course, is extremely dipped in Christian context, which is why a lot of people who still want to signify a bond of that type will go for collars instead of rings because they don't want the Christian baggage that comes along with the ring. There are some kinks um, and fetishes that people have uh, sort of a lot of stress and or perhaps that 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 like raise up the ick level okay there's like actually quite a few um, that 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 like tend to have very polarizing reactions in people um, now in truth this is true about a, but about like most sexual fetishes um, and it, it, you don't even, in fact, if you take it, if you really want to be honest about it, it doesn't even go so far as um, fetishes, right? Like people have all kinds of preferences. Like um, some people find the idea of, of like oral sex, like repulsive. There are just, there are just people out there. I would encourage them to maybe open their minds a little bit and try to overcome that because they're missing out on a lot. But hey, at the end of the day, you know what? Your preferences are yours. Um, uh, but there are people who find that repulsive. And there are then, of course, we've all met people who not only uh, take that to take it to be like, oh, this is personally repulsive to me, but that they wind it and wrap it up in some other greater thing. You guys have probably, in fact, no, wait a second. Hold on. There's this, there's an entire storyline in The Sopranos, one of the most famous television shows in the entire history of the world. In The Sopranos, there is a storyline where uh, it is discovered uh, that um, that the one of the patriarchs of the mafia family, Junior, uh, is like really, really good at oral sex on women. 
and he's like an old man, okay? But like, it turns out he's like really into it and really good. And uh, when when it when he when people find out about it, they start calling him like gay. They they basically say that he's a secret homosexual because what type of man would do would 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 do that to a woman? And he actually freaks out and he has a complete meltdown and then ends up beating his girlfriend. Uh, and leaving her, the, uh, who, by the way, the show goes through pains to show that he's like the happiest that he's ever been with this girlfriend. But he gets so tormented by people's like, by his own and other people's uh, obsession with the, the repulsiveness of doing oral sex that uh, he has a complete and utter mental meltdown. So this... But this, of course, doesn't just apply to things like oral sex. This applies to all kinds of things. There are there are tons of kinks, um, and and fetishes that uh, uh, that that basically um, sort of uh, provoke strong reactions in people, either positively or negatively. And it's important to remember that just because you don't like something doesn't mean that it's bad. Okay. And also, furthermore, just because there are potentially problematic outcomes of something doesn't necessarily mean that it can be written off as bad. A perfect example of this, okay? Um, many people, let's talk about um, let's talk about something like choking, okay? Choking, you know, choking somebody. Choking is one of the most common fetishes in the world. Like by pure numbers, you can like a lot of people will um, admit uh, that they are into choking. Okay. However, um, it's actually one of the most dangerous as far as engaging in, and it has an incredibly high likelihood of uh, injury because people don't actually know what they're doing and it's a very fragile part of the body. Um, people get injured and hurt uh, very easily uh, engaging in choking and yet it is one of the most commonly admitted to uh, sexual fetishes in the world. Um, which is part of the reason why a kink community has formed around uh, being able to figure out ways to safely teach people how to engage in something that is highly pleasurable to them um, But to do it safely, but as you can see the point being here is that even fairly mundane uh, 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 Fetishes can sometimes have negative outcomes uh, because of uh, Externalities basically risks that come along with the territory, but that doesn't necessarily make them bad in and of themselves. And this is something that you encounter very, very often um, in uh, conversations around kink, in conversations around fetishes, and obviously very frequently in conversations around so-called paraphilias. Um, and of course, I'm not going to go into details here uh, because that's not what this is about. This is more about telling people to, to fucking cool it just a tiny bit. Um, with how they react to this. Something that I really hate to see, and I've seen this a lot, is this sort of um, armchair psychologizing. And I've been sort of spending this segment laying out the sort of building blocks of what we're talking about um, because I think it's important. But uh, I guess now I want to, to talk about this sort of armchair psychologizing, um, which is basically, Someone encounters uh, a a fetish or a kink that they are unfamiliar with. Okay, so maybe they encounter a stray image, a fetish image that is just sort of like uh, raw, engaging in uh, some kind of sexual fixation, and they go, "Ooh, I don't like that. That's that's yucky to me. It it, it squicks me out. It makes me go." Ugh. Um, uh, and uh, then they go, uh, and then it, it sticks in their mind because for whatever reason, uh, they, they remember it and maybe it keeps bothering them. Um, and some people will find a 
desire to sort of explain the action. Um, and when people tend to do this, uh, that urge can guide you in a good direction or it can guide you in a bad direction. Sometimes it prompts someone to sort of humanely engage with another being and try to figure out, hey, like an empathetic response of like, wow, I don't understand this, what's going on? But a lot of times, given our cultural context, given the fact that in America, where I you know, stream from and to predominantly, in America, we have an extremely Puritan sexual history. This country is uh, very, has a huge, huge, huge uh, obsession with shame around sex and nudity um, that is more extreme than, um, than a lot of other countries really fully realize how extreme it is. You know, it, it's pretty intense. Um, so here, a lot of people have a instinct to basically figure out why, the, why it's wrong, what's going wrong. And, and there's this, it, it annoys me because it's so presumptive and it's so arrogant. Um, a lot of people don't even know why they themselves have a fetish or engage in a kink, okay? Um, and, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's unfortunate. Um, people, you know, that 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 sometimes there is this sort of desire to basically, I don't know, clinically diagnose people with something, and I I've seen this. Uh, this is a this is a cycle that occurs online. I've seen where um, there are sort of surges of of or periods of time where this opinion starts to resurface, or the, or not this opinion, this type of behavior uh, starts to resurface. And uh, I would encourage people not to do it. Um, I think that a lot of the armchair psychoanalyzing um, is generally baseless. Um, and I'm not saying that there aren't times where it's kind of necessary uh, to a certain degree. Like for example, um, I think that it's like I think that it's far more fair uh, to to sort of deeply analyze uh, like cultural obsessions that are disguised uh, fetishes. Like for example, uh, the sort of ex the far Christian right is extremely obsessed with virginity, but they claim it's not sexual. They constantly claim, no, 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 it's not sexual. It's a matter of spirituality. And I think it's much more fair to engage in a sort of aggressive analysis of this like masquerading thing. But I think that you have to be a lot more careful when you're just kind of like free balling it off of uh, off of like images you see on the internet. Like you go on to like, you're like, you're going to your favorite furry porn website and you're like, oh yeah, um, I'm about to have a great time on fur affinity or whatever. And um, and you go there and you're just like sitting there and you're going, yes, yes. And you're pretending to be, you know, Sigmund Freud going like, mm, yes, I'm taking notes. Ah, yes, I see a vor fetish. You must want to die. Uh, oh, an inflation fetish. Hmm, this probably came from the time that your uh, mother uh, blew up uh, a kiddie pool for you when you were a baby and it excited you. Like, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. It's really hard to know exactly why people are into things, and most people will never be able to know. We don't fully understand how sexual attraction uh, develops in the brain, and also, um, it's not clean. It's not easy to know why something like, okay, like, to some people, if I say, um, Watch, here's a little here's a little test. If I say right now, um, a you know, a, a, a strong dominant woman uh, holds you uh, your you know, holds you down uh, at, at the at the at, at like sort of knife point and uh, and tells you exactly what you're gonna do for her. Some people are gonna become scared by that and other people are going to become very horny by that. You see, it's that simple. And who knows why? 
like it's really difficult to know exactly why that provokes different reactions in different people in different people yeah some people don't even care at all i was with you until the knife yeah see do you see what i'm saying though yeah the scooby-doo that's my fetish so it's not that simple to sort of just jump to conclusions and and i i urge people to be careful with that um there is a plague uh, <laughs> there is a plague on youtube of people uh pseudo intellectualizing their own like generic opinions um and i hate it especially when it comes to things like uh, uh like kink and fetishes because people really do talk out of their ass a lot but they dress it up in very 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 fancy and pseudo intellectual language to make it sound like they've come up with something profound when in reality they don't really know what they're talking about they just got a feeling they just kind of feel weird about it okay um yeah don't do that shit. Some people call this kink shaming, um, but I don't think, I, I think kink shaming is too limited. It's more like, uh, like I said, it's more like kink psychoanalyzing or fetish psychoanalyzing in some cases. Sometimes it doesn't even quite get to the level of kink analyzing because they're not actually engaging with like the kink as a whole. They're engaging with a single person's expression of a, like, or, 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 like an expression of a fetish. It's, yeah, it's armchair psychology, yeah. Yeah, oh uh, yeah, that's a good term. Uh, uh, Xerox 13th sir says yum yucking, or peop some people will say you're yucking my yum and I'm yucking your, or, or whatever. Yeah, that is something that people, it, it, think of it like this. Okay, if you, um, if you, <laughs> Pathologizing, that is the extreme form of it, is pathologizing. Yeah, where people basically say, oh, this is a mental disorder or whatever. Which um, I think the case could be made for very, very, very certain edge cases that you could probably make a case that like there is a pathology in certain types. Um, but I also think that a lot of that is dependent on context, right? Like, uh, like I don't know. Uh, people make extremely violent art uh, uh, that is uh, that is often s fairly sexual in nature. An example that comes to mind is the wildly popular Saw series. And I don't know that I can like denounce the Saw series for engaging in like scary, uh, uh, sexualization of violence when it is ultimately an exercise of fiction and is uh, very obviously very open to the fact that it's fictional and almost comical at times, right? Can you imagine if we did this for uh, like, for like your favorite candy bar? Usually we would call somebody who's like super weird about that, like an elitist. Like, oh, ha. Huh. Your enjoyment of the Mars bar uh, indicates that you have a, uh, a, pr a predilection to violence and, 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 uh, and scalawaggery. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's silly. Yeah. People do this, people hate people with certain hobbies and interests. Yeah, that's true, they do. But like, I think that the cultural reaction is generally to sort of like, okay, maybe not. I guess it depends on the hobby because some people do really bully people with certain hobbies. Um, yeah. Um, I think people should be very careful about this and I, I uh, do not respect uh, fake intellectualizing of people's like personal disgust. In fact, I think that it's fairly, it's, it's pretty embarrassing uh, and uh, unintellectual actually. I think that people show their ass when they do this. Um, there is a remarkable amount of reactionary behavior that people engage in 
um, uh, that that literally they see something and they're only it's new to them, and so they their only known response, excuse me, is to condemn it and and retreat to a safe. Uh, a safe zone where where things are controlled again, and I think that is a a sort of form of reactionary sentiment um, that uh, that I think is is somewhat problematic. Uh, Anna Ariston, have you talked about C and C? It gets a lot of heat, even in the kink community, uh, even among kink communities. Yeah, um, and part of the reason for that is because uh, it's intense, even for a lot of kinksters. But uh, it's kind of in the name, right? Consensual non-consent. Um, that like the fact, that, like the fact that it's called that is is kind of a uh, is kind of key, isn't it? Right, it kind of gives away that the structure is obviously being thought about, and that the participants are thinking about it. That it's more about the sort of trappings and themings as opposed to any. Uh, how how can you non? Yeah, it's it's silly. It it gives the game away. Um, was that a plane? Yes, that was a plane. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of them. Yeah. Um, I, I think, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of pathologization. Oh, th there's another aspect of this that's less extreme. Um, there is a, this is a really weird one, okay? And I recognize that we're sort of like, I've talked about the basics, but hear me out on this, okay? There is a very weird uh, one-sided relationship with sadism in BDSM kink communities that bondage, Say sadism, masochism, um, you know the B, the or bondage, domination, sadism, and masochism is is one such algorithm, and there's this weird one sidedness where masochists are completely and utterly understood, and it's basically like, oh yeah, like obviously, haha, of course you're, of course it's fun to get, you know, controlled, but then the sadists are are looked at like they're evil in some way, as and it's like, well wait, well like, who, who's gonna give you your masochism? <laughs> who's gonna indulge your masochism? Like, it's very weird. Um, it's a really weird thing. And that is something that like plagues even kink communities, even communities that are supposed to be able to think about this. And it's very strange, right? That like, oh, you would be suspicious of, of, of somebody who is engaging in like sexual sadism, even though uh, they're like going out of their way to, to temper that and to, to do it in a healthy way. It's really strange. Um, it, it's a weird double standard. That attitude contributes to the top shortage? It does, actually. I'm not even kidding you. Um, it does. Because, believe it or not, okay, uh, not all tops are sadists, okay? But a lot of tops do have a sadistic streak. And that sadistic streak allows them to effectively access the fantasies of masochists. And, you know, it just so happens that a lot of masochists also happen to be bottoms. Not all of them, by the way. Not all of them, but a lot of them are. Um, and um, believe it or not, uh, 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 sadists have feelings too. Especially the ones that are taking the time to safely engage in their form of, of sadism fetish. Isn't that kind of strange, right? And um, it actually does. It, it leads people to basically never, uh, never go any deeper because of shame or fear that they're going to be judged. And they are judged. It's not an irrational fear. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunate. But again, it comes from what I've been talking about this whole time, this desire to sort of pathologize. Is there really a top shortage? Um, there are in certain communities, yeah. Um, there is the there is the sort of perception that there is a there are like 10, 10 bottoms for every top. 
uh, and and it gets even more if we'd stop using top and bo top and bottom. I do think sometimes what, one thing that kind of irks me in these conversations is that there's a conflation of top and bottom versus dom and sub. Um, dom dom and sub is a much better way of talking about this, like dominant and submissive, um, or sadist and masochist. But yeah, even in even among top versus bottom, there is absolutely a disparity in sheer numbers. At least by my observation um uh being you know connected to a lot of these spaces um and i think it's because there's a uh you want to know the real reason that i think that it is and this is my theory and this is not a matter i'm, I'm trying not to you know commit the same problem of over psychoanalyzing but i can't help but notice that uh in a society where shame is central to sex that um if something is done to you you don't have to feel bad about it as much you don't have to feel as bad because you didn't choose to do it so tops uh doms uh sadists these are people who are choosing quote unquote, to engage in something that induces guilt. Um, and I think that that um, in, in a society that is completely pervaded with sexual guilt, every aspect of sexual life in America is just overloaded with uh, like re remnants of, cri of Christian guilt. Uh, I think that that can actually become a serious emotional burden. Um, especially when it's perpetuated sometimes even by the people who are sort of enjoying uh, the benefits of, of the, the, the tops, the doms, and the sadists. Yes, Discord and Vol says they're kind. They they they're forced into a role of being sexual sin eaters. Yes, I think that's fairly accurate. That basically, like, there's this moral expectation um, that dominant people, sadistic people, or uh, or uh, tops are sort of they're supposed to take the burden onto themselves of the guilt, uh, and that's not fair. It isn't fair. Um, yeah, because they're just people engaging just like anybody else in something that brings them some level of pleasure. And it's a big deal. Has anybody ever heard of the term um, top drop? Which I think is a misnomer, again, because of the conflation of dominance and uh, dominance of submission and top versus bottom. Because, of course, bottoming is not inherently submissive and topping is not inherently dominant. But the term top drop... Um, if uh, regardless, we'll talk about the term top drop. Um, oh, I'll read all the donos in a minute. Um, top drop is a term that refers to uh, basically um, after a you know kink scene, as they're called, or after a an encounter uh, that involves kink, usually uh, you know intense kink. That there is a uh, a, a severe, um, like basically that a, that a top will crash and have an emotional breakdown um, because the aftercare, which is a key, I should, I should define this. For those who don't know, aftercare is a term that is, re that is commonly used in kink communities to refer to basically uh, stepping out of whatever intense activity that you were doing. So like, for example, say that you are in a, uh, a sort of uh, a punishment situation, okay? So you're, you're engaging in a, a sexual scenario, a scene um, in which somebody is being punished and there's it's sexual and maybe it's really really super great the reality is that it's very intense and sometimes it can cause lingering emotions so there's this concept called aftercare where after engaging in this you step out of those roles perhaps for a little bit or you soften it so that people can have time to recover and not feel traumatized by um you know pleasurable but in but intense activities think of it like um you know think of it like resting up 
uh, after a very intense sports game. If you go and play a game of uh, a game of soccer and you play your absolute hardest and it's really difficult and maybe you maybe it's like maybe you win the game, maybe you lose the game, you have the time of your life and it's the best game you've ever played, but afterwards you're drained of energy, you might just want to hang out with your team and have a speech from your coach that tells you, "Hey, everything's going to be okay. You did a great job out there. It was wonderful to see you all. Remember, we're a team and we're in this together. Even if it was the most fun and game of your life, it's still so intense that emotions can be all over the place. Hence, in kink, there's this concept of aftercare. Um, and sometimes the aftercare is perceived as being most important to the submissive person or to the masochist because you know they might have been the recipient of certain be of certain actions, the hot wax or the whatever. But the reality is, of course, that that's not entirely true, and that um, because of this effect that I've talked about. Uh, the dominant or the sadist or the top can um, sometimes basically have a severe emotional crash afterwards because they feel a sense of guilt. A sense of guilt for um, engaging in something they shouldn't feel guilty about at all. Killjoy40k says, aftercare is supposed to get you back to baseline because being at a 10 um, is it, it can be harmful uh, and, uh, and kink can get up to 10 pretty quickly. Someone has to help get people back down to baseline. It's why climaxing is a thing. Emotions are hard to process and brains can be mushy. Yeah, that's true. Yep, it's, it's you can't live your whole life at maximal intensity. Sometimes you need to be able to calm down. Uh, like I said, I think I think the sports analogy is a good one, uh, you know. But another example is like a, a non-sports example is imagine that you're doing a workout, right? And you go and you run on the treadmill, and your heart rate gets really high, which is good for you, for your heart rate to get higher, for you to be in that high-intensity exercise environment. But then afterwards, you need to bring your heart rate back down. Same thing goes for for kink and for for sexual engagement. And so aftercare is very important. And there is a problem of, uh, of like dominant top role people uh, basically being neglected on that front and assuming that, oh, well, you were the one doing it as if it's not a mutually consensual engagement. And it's, it's problematic, it's a huge issue. Uh, a, quick, a quick addendum. To my segment, I know that uh, that I technically said that it was over, but I wanted to make a quick addendum. Okay, um, uh, one of my uh, wonderful chatters brought up the fact um, that uh, trans women often uh, feel uh, a a sense of invalidation um, from engaging in topping. Um, first of all, let me just be 100% clear, that does not invalidate your role uh, as a trans person or as a trans woman or as a woman generally, okay? There are plenty of women uh, in the world, cis, trans, who do not, who, who very, very much enjoy being in the top role. Um, that's the first thing I want to say. And secondly, I want to say that that, that in and of itself comes from a uh, um, comes from a societal an unbearable and unfair societal standard that women are always supposed to be not just bottoms but submissive bottoms um, and it's not true it's not true and it's not um, it's not even what every what mo like what most people like there is a section of society that is highly fixated on women always being um, submissive bottom types, but that's only a section of society. There are a lot of people who find um, uh, women who are able to top, who are able to be dominant uh, on top of that, um, uh, very, very wonderful, and it does not invalidate uh, your role at all. But I understand why people fear this. Um, much like what I was talking about generally with this sort of tendency to sort of put a burden of guilt onto dominant and top roles, this of course also applies with mixed in misogyny uh, to trans women um, and 
also cis women. Keep in mind that there is a stigma against cis women uh, uh, being on top, even when a lot of people really enjoy it. Um, there's like movies that make jokes about this, um, even when a lot of people really enjoy it. So um, yeah. Um, uh, Silent says, this is actually why I really don't like the jokes about all trans girls being bottoms or subs. Well, the jokes, uh, the jokes are a, sort of a product of like, it's, it's this, uh, it's like a chicken and egg thing, right? Because the jokes don't are, I mean, the jokes can sometimes, depending on the structure of the joke, reinforce the structure. But the reason why people make that joke is it is because a lot of trans people feel, um, you know, trans women a lot of times feel pigeonholed into a role. Um, even even if they would really like to, they feel like they won't be accepted for who they are um, if they are uh, perceived as being a top or being at all dominant in any way. Um, and I think that should be rejected and fought against. Um, so yeah, that was just my little addendum. I wanted to, to talk about that. Um, being a top position doesn't, is not a masculine position or anything like that. Uh, it oh, that, that sort of idea only comes from the sort of hyper-conservative, hyper-Christian understanding of gender roles. The idea that, like I said at the very beginning of this segment, the idea that men are supposed to be the dominant tops in every relationship uh, or else they're not doing it the way God wanted. And that has carried through and echoes all the way into uh, even secular or largely secular communities that have just never taken the time to challenge that idea. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, that was my addendum. I uh, hope that you appreciate it, and uh, I hope that it makes sense. Thank you. Anyway, uh, I hope that um, I hope that this this sec segment. I know it was off the cuff and probably a little bit disorganized, but I hope that this segment uh, gave people some basic information and encouraged people to not have knee jerk reactions to encountering fetishes that they're unfamiliar with. Um, while I will admit that there are some fetishes that are more problematic or more at risk of becoming problematic than others, the reality is that just because uh, there are potential bad outcomes of a kink doesn't mess of a kink or a fetish doesn't mean that that thing in and of itself is bad. Um, so be careful with it. Try to not try to be understanding to other people, and you and other people will be happier in the long run. Um, it's not good to just judge people without fully understanding them. It's not good to psychoanalyze people for no reason. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you enjoyed this segment, I do talk, I don't talk about this particular subject all that much, um, but it has, you know, it's a topic I've revisited a couple of times throughout the history of my channel. Generally, uh, I talk about politics, I talk about video games. So if you're interested in those types of things, press that subscribe button down below. Oh, I <laughs> I said politics and video games. I should talk about, I talk about a lot of uh, uh, queer politics and queer video games <laughs> in addition. That's a big focus for my channel. Uh, so yeah, um, that too. So if you're interested in those things, press the subscribe button down below and please share me your thoughts in the comments. I would really love to hear uh, what people have to say. Um, yeah, so please give me your thoughts down below and uh, thank you for watching.